was that a tough market or a tough space for you to find? Well, you know, it was really built on a focus group of three, which was the three <laughs> of us. Right? We were trying to furnish our own places and we just, you know, we didn't like what we could afford and we couldn't afford what we liked. So we just thought there, if there were three of us, there might be more. Um, but I think business books would tell you, or at least business books I read or came across after we started Blue Dot would say. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Hey there, sunshine. Today's episode is brought to you by The Perfect Match, a game where designers submit mood boards created with Adobe stock assets and earn the chance to play on a fab game show to win big. As designers, we pitch good vibes and great ideas through visuals all day, every day. But how well does our design communicate? Do clients and higher-ups really understand the work we put in front of them? Well, let's find out. Test your mad skills by assembling a brand-inspired mood board with Adobe stock images to the perfect match. And if your skillful project is chosen, you'll be featured on Adobe's monthly live streaming game show with other groovy designers, art directors, and creatives, where the winner goes home with $750. It's free to participate in the perfect match. Submit an entry and Adobe will buy you coffee for your time. Visit theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more and bring your design skills to win big. That's theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with the founders of Modern Home Furnishings and design brand Blue Dot, John Christakis and Maurice Blinks. Based in Minneapolis, Blue Dot has 12 locations across the US with new stores in Miami, San Francisco, and more on the way. You may know Blue Dot from their gorgeous modern pieces that are all over Instagram and social media. Or if you're like me and don't have a Blue Dot location in your backyard, Blue Dot may occasionally grace your mailbox or your coffee table with a catalog. In 2020 and 2021, their focus became updating their home office for continued work from home and the need for flexible indoor and outdoor social spaces. Today, we're going to be chatting with John and Maurice about how they've continued to innovate and push their design forward in the last two years, meeting these new demands without sacrificing integrity of their products. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with John Christakis and Maurice Blinks. Okay, kids, all the way from Minneapolis, I've got John Christakis and Maurice Blinks. John and Maurice, welcome to Obsessed Show. Thank you. Happy to be here, Josh. Well, you know, you may not realize it since I was talking to your, your PR team, but, uh, you know, I, I graciously offered to let you guys redo my, my house <laughs> and home furnishings as part of the interview. I haven't heard back from them yet, so I'm still a little, <laughs> little fingers crossed. But, but in, in all seriousness, I do really love your design aesthetic and you guys have just some, some awesome stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, so outside of me gushing over your design aesthetic, um, you know, always love to start out with origin stories. So I'm curious both, um, what led the two of you into the design biz and then what led you to create blue dot, your own, your own design brand. Um, you want me to start Maurice? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Take it away. Um, I guess I've always had these two competing interests in my life between, sort of art and commerce. My mom was an artist and my dad was an entrepreneur. So I, I grew up screwing around in my mom's studio and uh, working after school in my dad's factory and watching him build a business. And those aren't in, interests that go together very well, <laughs> necessarily. Uh, <laughs> so in college, I was an art, you know, double major in studio art and economics. And Maurice and I, be good friends from college and Charlie, our other co-founder, uh, we spent, you know, uh, a year back, backpacking around Asia after college. And I think that's maybe when the early ideas of Blue Dot were formed or just the notion of wouldn't it be great to spend your days um, doing something creative um, and doing something that you love, that kernel of an idea. We all went off to kind of do our own things. Um, I went on to business school and, and started a career in business and um, Maurice and, and Charlie went into architecture and then about maybe three years after grad school or so, we, we, I got the itch to kind of 
take the take the leap and and we started talking about it and these guys agreed to at least entertain the concept for a while and uh and and the idea was really um modern design at that time was was not was was either ikea or very very high end there really wasn't much in the middle back in the late mid to late 90s so we just felt like there was space for well designed um enduring designs that um that could be made and sold at more reasonable prices. So I love that idea of how do we create something in between Ikea and a super high end modern line? Was that a tough space to, to kind of carve out? I mean, I can imagine the cost of, you know, quote unquote, doing things the right way gets expensive really fast. And then you're met with, you know, how do I meet these supply needs or labor needs or anything else? Like how do we drive the price down? I, was that a tough market or a tough space for you to find? Well, you know, it was really built on a focus group of three, which was the three <laughs> of us. Right? We were trying to furnish our own places and we just, you know, we didn't like what we could afford and we couldn't afford what we liked. So we just thought there, if there were three of us, there might be more. Um, but I think business books would tell you, or at least business books I read or came across after we started Blue Dot would say, you never want to be in the middle, right? You either want to be the cheapest or you want to be the luxury brand. But we saw parallels. We, we really studied uh, the apparel market back in the day. So retail apparel, and we were looking at uh, Old Navy on the low end and whatever, Armani at the high end. But you had sort of these banana republics and J. Crews that were living in a middle space. Uh, and so that was kind of the analogy, I think, that we, we latched onto. And we went to our very first trade show in 1997 at the Javits Center in New York. Um, and just to rewind quickly, back then the idea was we were going to be a wholesale brand. So we were going to mm -hmm. sell to retail stores that would win, then sell our product to end consumers. And we went to that show and we showed our products and we showed our prices and our quality. And you know, the booth was mobbed. It was really, there was clearly a need for this. Where did the name, I, we didn't talk about this in advance, but where did the name Blue Dot come from? <laughs> it, um, we had a long list of names and, and, um, at the time when we were dreaming up blue dot, we would send faxes back and forth with each other. Cause it was pre email. And we've got, we still have those faxes with these, these lists of names that thank God we, um, avoided, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, we think it was around the time that, um, and we can't tell if we made this up or if it's true. I think it's true <laughs> around the time that Prince who's, you know, the, um, late Prince, uh, it was um, from Minneapolis around the time he changed his name to just a graphic symbol. And, and one of us in the group said, Would, wouldn't, what if our name was just a graphic symbol, like literally just a, a blue dot with no, with no words in it at all. Um, and we kind of latched onto the simplicity of it and the fact that it didn't kind of tie you into anything. It's not like Pottery Barn that doesn't end up being Pottery Barn or Restoration Hardware that doesn't end up being about hardware in the end, you know, it was fairly simple and straightforward and a little lowbrow, which was um, something that we liked about it too. Memorable. Yeah. I like that for sure. Uh, and definitely stands out in the world of, you know, brand names that are somebody's last name or, or something like that. Um, so fast forward a little bit and tell us about what the team looks like today. What, what's the kind of the corporate structure at Blue Dot? Sure. So yeah, we're based in Minneapolis. We're in an old 1950s, uh, actually a manufacturing building uh, in Northeast Minneapolis. And I think we have about 90 folks in this building. Does that sound about right, John? Yeah. Between finance and product development and marketing and all the different functions. So all of that is based here. Uh, then we have a distribution center, a warehouse about 30 miles outside of Minneapolis, uh, where we have another 35 or 40 people. Uh, and that's about 260,000 square feet. So one of the ideas of Blue Dot was, you know, going back to what John was saying about being sort of more accessible was having product in stock. So it's really important that, uh, you know, in non COVID supply chain, uh, <laughs> times we have 95% of our product is in stock in, in Minneapolis. Uh, so, uh, and then we have the stores that you mentioned at the top of the broadcast here, uh, that, uh, has, you know, we have a handful of, uh, employees in those stores as well. Is that kind of middle yeah. of the country location strategic or just worked out that that's where <laughs> you guys were based? <laughs> it's totally unstrategic uh, <laughs> and completely coincidental. <laughs> no, I happen to 
uh, move here after grad school for a job. And, and, um, as the three of us were talking about blue dot, I, you know, I was the first one to, to quit my job and say, I'm going to do this. And Maurice and Charlie wanted to do it too, but had commitments that they couldn't quit or weren't quite ready to quit until it looked like it was going to be going somewhere. Um, so I, I think I got the privilege of making them come here, um, rather than me moving to Chicago or, or Phoenix, heaven forbid. Yeah, we were, we were 25 years ahead of this whole moving out of the expensive cities. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> so what about, um, design influences? So I, I see definitely some nods to modernism and there's some, uh, I feel like there's some levity in some of the designs, like some, some stuff that when I see it, it just brings a smile to my face. Cause it's just a cooler kind of playful design, but what were some of the things that have influenced you guys or continue to? Um, you want me, I'll, I'll jump in Maurice. Yeah, I mean, jump in. We, we, we share, a, a, uh, I think a love for the same, you know, artists like Donald Judd, for example, and sort of minimalism in the 1960s, I think is something we all gravitate towards. I would probably, for me, it's like folks like Dieter Rams or, or Poole Kyrholm, uh, who, you know, just are, have an incredible clarity and simplicity, um, about the way they work. Um, yeah, I think our stuff, our stuff maybe has a little bit more lightness to it or, um, yeah. I, and I, I don't know where that comes from. Maybe it's our personalities who knows, but there's also, I think a really, I think we're really attracted to kind of anonymous, humble design as well. Uh, again, tying into the, this whole idea that Blue Dot was reacting against a more kind of elitist, high modernist design of the late eighties and early nineties. But, you know, if, whether it's sort of, you know, HVAC equipment parts or, you know, a clothespin or, you know, just these sort of unsung heroes of design, I think is something that we really found out in Asia. John mentioned our trip with Charlie to Asia, backpacking, you know, 10 bucks a day, you know, scraping it through Asia, but really seeing all these amazing things that weren't high design by any means, but just beautifully designed and, and amazingly functional. So I think we probably pull, I don't know, I would argue even maybe more out of that realm then we pull out of sort of the more high design, uh, you know, what would be considered high design from the mid century. Yeah. I was looking on the website a little bit, uh, yeah. earlier today and even things like your wall shelf, that's called a wealth. <laughs> like some <laughs> of the naming I think is, is just, just funny too. <laughs> Maybe it's my, my inner dad joke fan that, uh, that enjoyed no, that. No, no, no. There was a, there's a good shelving system called shelf. Uh, <laughs> it's the same, same thing. That's just, yeah, our, our, um, I haven't really grown up much, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, it also makes it approachable, right? The humor kind of breaks the, breaks the seriousness of the moment and just says, Hey, you know, this is fun. Let's, let's, you know, it's modern design, big deal. Let's have fun. So, uh, 2020 happened in 2021. Um, what, what have you guys seen demand wise and how is, how have the last, uh, you know, 18 months or so shaped, um, where the demand has been and, and fulfillment and, you know, all of those challenges that we're hearing about with manufacturing, how's, how has all of that impacted you guys? Oh, well, at first it was pretty scary. I mean, we didn't know how it was going to impact us and, um, and, you know, we had to shut all of our stores down and they were shut down. I, I think I look back at our Instagram post and, you know, it was mid March and we said, we'll be, we'll be open again, April 1st. Uh, and, and every other retailer was saying the same thing at the same time. Like, you know, this will just be a two week thing, <laughs> which is just incredible now. But um, so our stores were physical stores were closed for three months, which impacted demand uh, and impacted sales. But ultimately a lot of that business shifted online. And, um, you know, as, as you've probably read about people are kind of stuck at home and not spending money on, traveling or eating out or, or anything really. Um, and, um, I think probably savings went up and credit card debt went down and, um, people sitting around looking at their old tired furniture that they hadn't really considered because they were so busy in their lives. So, um, it's led to, I think, uh, um, people reevaluating their spaces and, um, investing in them and realizing the importance of them. So it's been terrific for our business. We just feel incredibly lucky. We, we literally just lucked out. I mean, Thank God we weren't in the airline business or hotel business. Right. 
well, outdoor, I think doubled last year, our outdoor business, which was, you know, it hasn't, it's, it's a newer category for us, but it really took off as well. So all that demand started to really spike in the summer and, and, and fall. And that's when things started to get bad on the supply side. And for us, it was, it was, uh, it's really started to hit maybe spring of this year. And it's just all the things you hear about. There aren't enough, there aren't enough trucks. There aren't enough workers. There every, everywhere is, there's a problem everywhere. Usually there's just one or two places that you have problems. And now it's kind of every point in the supply chain. Uh, you mentioned outdoor had increased significantly in demand. Is there like a, a hottest product or anything in particular that's, that stood out for you guys as more popular? I think it was pretty, pretty spread out. Wasn't it, John? It was, it's pretty broad across, across all outdoor. Yeah. And, and, you know, in our uh, outdoor assortment is we probably have seven or eight collections. It's not massive, um, but it was pretty evenly spread. Yeah. I think people were, it, oh, itching to get outdoors, right? And just sort of felt cooped up potentially. So, okay. So, I, I can tell you what the worst. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say the worst, the worst single category for us in 2020 was sleeper sofas. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's having anyone over, no guests over uh, during COVID. <laughs> yes. And surely not letting them sleep on your sofa if, they, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> if they're walking in your house. <laughs> Um, so maybe to change gears a little bit, um, you know, we've talked to a lot of CEOs and founders and creative directors on the show before. Um, and so, you know, kind of going down this path historically, I, I realize nobody has a typical day or a standard thing, but I am curious kind of how you guys, um, divide labor or roles between founders and kind of the differences of what your typical duties look like. Yeah, well, we, Maurice and I, um, and our third co-founder, Charlie, doesn't work with us day to day any longer. He went back into the field of architecture several years ago. So Maurice and I kind of run the business together, but um, we, we split the functions kind of front of house, back of house, I guess. Uh, you know, I, I am in charge of more sales, marketing, and finance. Um, and Maurice is in charge of uh, all the hard stuff like um, production and fulfillment and um things along those lines. Uh, we, we both share together in, um, in design because neither one of us wants to, wants to seed that to the other. It's the most fun part of our job. So um, we're kind of, I'd say pretty equally involved there. Um, that sound right, Maurice? Yep. Um, you know, another thing that I uh, uncovered uh, as I was doing some research was the, the book that you guys produced a couple of years ago called uh, less is more difficult. Um, give us uh, some, some insights into what folks would find in the pages of the book. <laughs> well, it was a really fun project. I mean, uh, obviously a design exercise in some ways to figure out what the content would be. Uh, and so it ended up as kind of a, a few different parts. I guess the, the part that I think is the kind of the most interesting and maybe potentially the most fun is there's a section in there that is reproductions of the faxes that we've sent each other in the early days. John mentioned before <laughs> that there was no email in 1992 or 1995 when we were kind of starting to bake this idea. And the designers of the book found a paper that has that sort of same feel of the thermal fax paper. You know, it has mm -hmm. just a very distinctive feel to it, hand to it. Uh, so to see all those and to read through those is I think a ton of fun. And, and the thing that was really interesting and was pointed out to us from folks that are newer to the team is that a lot of the things that we talked about it in those faxes about the personality of the company, about what would be important and what would it look like and what would the company feel like? And, uh, all those things are still really, really true. So I think that was, I, I think as founders 20 years later, that was incredibly satisfying. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a it was a beast um, to put together to kind of try and chronicle twenty years of twenty years of work. When in the early days, you're not you know we weren't saving anything or documenting anything. <laughs> like the, the last thing we were thinking about was a uh, was a monograph twenty years later. I mean, we were like thinking about making payroll a week from 
week from today. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we had to unearth a lot of stuff and kind of stitch together back together some history and from, from those early days, but that was super fun too, kind of going back through, through memory, memory lane. And now it's really, really nice that we have it all kind of in, in one spot. There is a bit of a, a business story in there too. A, a lot of folks, I know we give talks or give lectures, um, they're often interested in the behind the scenes, like, well, how did you do it? Like, how did, you know, what, what was it like to build a business? So um, there's a long oral history in there that really kind of chronicles, like, you know, the challenges and all the twists and turns that we faced along the way. Because uh, we started Blue Dot with $50,000 of our own money. This, we, we're not some one of these new Instagram brands that has, you know, $30 million in the Series A round and another $100 million in the Series B round. Like, that. that is not how we started Blue Dot or how we continue to run Blue Dot. So um, much more, uh, uh, scratch and claw kind of path. Yeah, I can, I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> I think my first business was, a was a comp USA, uh, loan at the cash register kind of situation to get my first <laughs> couple of computers and <laughs> nice. the brand is long gone now. Um, so I'm curious to hear maybe about some of your favorite or proudest professional moments. And I'm guessing, those might be different for each of you. Hmm. Yeah, it's a, a, a tough one. Um, I don't have any. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> showing up every Monday morning, right? <laughs> That's right. It's hard. I mean, I I think um, if you went back to the very the days before we started Blue Dot, you know, we'd probably say that that person, those, those people we were back then would look at what we've done so far. And they would say the national design award that we got from the Cooper Hewitt a couple of years ago was kind of the pinnacle of that. Uh, because I think when we started Blue Dot, we were really thinking about sort of the design legacy. And I think we've changed, well, I don't want to speak for John, but we sort of talked about this together over the, over the last, especially few years about how amazing all the people are that are work with us every day and the family that we've kind of built here at Blue Dot. Uh, I think for me, that would, that would be the proudest moment is all these really smart, really dedicated people that we put together in this building. Yeah. And the, and the way that that um, impacts the world and the way that we as a company show up in the world, you know, um, and that the vibe people get when they walk into the, our stores or, or they interact with anybody that works with Blue Dot or how a situation is handled with a customer service call or, you know, just showing up and, um, uh, uh, you know, working hard, being nice to people, doing the right thing. Uh, it's doesn't seem like a lot, but in, in, in this world, um, sometimes that stands out. And um, yeah, that was the one thing I think both of us were surprised by. We never really understood the, um, how rewarding that part is, how rewarding it is that this, this family, this ecosystem of people that exists solely because we had this crazy idea 25 years ago, um, how cool that is and the collective energy and the collective creativity and positivity that, that, that group of people puts out into the world is really rewarding. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say the national design award is a, it, it's, it's a result of all of that, right? It's not, I mean, I think again, going back to kind of the more sort of e ego driven people that we were in our, in our late twenties was you know, t just the three of us are going to design a bunch of great stuff and we're going to get a big award. And, you know, the National Design Award is super satisfying because it's such a group effort. Yeah, very cool. Um, do you have, I know you mentioned Dieter Rams and, and a few other folks. I wonder if there are any other design heroes or folks that you maybe looked up to coming up in the design biz early on, or maybe, maybe even other brands that you admire today that are out in the marketplace. Yeah, I, mean, I think early on we we looked at like you know folks like Charles and Ray Eames, and I think there's a there's a Midwestern kind of pragmatism there and an, an inventive spirit, you know, trying to figure out how to mold plywood in their kitchen. Uh, that kind of um, experimentation, I think, is um, attractive. Um, so there's some connections there. Other other brands, um, yeah, I think you. Know, brands that stay true to who they are. And, you know, I, some of these examples might've 
wavered in more recent years, but we're, I think, on the same path for many years. Crate and Barrel was a customer of ours long ago and, and a company that I really admire. Uh, and I think they've taken some twists and turns in the last four or five years. And that's maybe a result of just having to continually grow, that it's just hard to continue to stay, um, not niche, but to stay focused on what your true DNA is when you are at a billion in sales or I don't know mm -hmm. how they are, but you know, that you have to keep getting bigger and fraying around the edges. Patagonia is another one I think that we admire for a stick to that um, and a purity of purpose that um, really comes through. Well, the, with Patagonia, there's also a, there's a kind of a rebellious streak to it. I think it's sometimes when you start to build a company that's bigger than you thought it was ever going to be, you start looking up to bigger companies to say like, well, how do they solve that problem? Let's just solve it the same way that they did. And, you know, you can go down some pretty bland, create, you know, <laughs> imagine free zones if you do that. And I think to look at something like Patagonia at the scale that they are and some of the things that they do is a reminder that like, no, there's not a perfect way to run a big company. You can, you can do, you can do a lot of unusual things. And I think that's kind of liberating. Yeah. I think, um, you know, they, they almost, or, or maybe literally had a campaign about like, don't buy our new jacket. <laughs> yeah. I think that was the Black that. Friday ad or something, wasn't it? Like yeah. don't shop today. It's bad <laughs> for the environment. <laughs> just, uh, maybe some reverse psychology going on there too, but just, just a cool, like you said, just sort of a rebellious spirit about it that I think is really interesting. Um, so the, the theme of this show is, is obsession. And I, I think designers of all stripes, we find ourselves at various times obsessed with different things. Uh, I'm curious for each of you, and this doesn't have to be a design related obsession. I'm, I'm curious what you find that you're each most obsessed with right now. Hmm. Um, I, you know, I'm lately, I've been sort of obsessed with, um, with other people's creativity. Uh, and I, I mean, I start with my, my kids, not to talk about my kids, but the, but they, the, the, they're all like pursuing different creative things that, that my wife and I had nothing to do with necessarily pushing them on, or, you know, they kind of like fell into it on their own and they're, they're creating stuff, all of them, um, and putting, you know, things into the world that didn't exist before. And what's really, it's been really fun is for, and they're, you know, in college and sort of, um, older, um, but it's really fun to see how rewarding it is to them and how they're starting to understand that something that they created is now, again, a new thing in the world that didn't exist before they decided to create it. And that kind of realization, um, and that excitement that you see in them is, is awesome. And, you know, thank God they're um, producing stuff <laughs> rather than just consuming <laughs> stuff. There were many years when they could just consume stuff. Uh, but lately they've been producing a lot of great stuff. Oh, yeah. I'm, I guess I have a negative one and a positive one. I think I've, I definitely have an obsession with like Facebook as a product, you know, as a designer that to think that, you know, this thing is, it's actually just a product. Somebody's des they're designing this thing and the impact that it has on the world is, is pretty incredible. So I guess I, I, I've been sort of thinking about that. And like John, I have kids that are, you know, now they're sort of late teens, early twenties, but they definitely are sort of grew up on that. And as a designer, I guess I just think about, you know, the impact of design on the world uh, is, is the scale of that just blows my mind. So obsessed in kind of an angry way. Uh, <laughs> and then I guess, as a, you know, as I think through the sort of positive thing is being locked down and, you know, during the pandemic, my wife and I and my kids, we, we renovated and moved into a, into a house that was built in 1931, just before the door closed on the pandemic. So we were in this, in this place, we just kind of redone. And it's a really amazing piece of design. And it's almost better. Like I really wanted to build our own house. I wanted to find a lot, build a house. And I'm almost, I think I'm a lot happier living in this place and the surprise and the kind of looking at all the details, whoever, whoever designed this place did a really nice job and there's just amazing details. And so it's just kind of fun to sit sometimes and, and just stare at the door casings or <laughs> the, the window <laughs> detailings. And so I think it was kind of a blessing to, you know, at a time when you couldn't travel and you couldn't go out and you couldn't see things in real life to have something that I was just kind of totally into and totally curious about. 
you know, you both men- mentioned your, your children in college or in their twenties. Are, are any of your kids involved in the, in the business or do you see them coming on board in the future? Not yet. <laughs> just, uh, just internship or various internships here and there. Yeah. Very cool. Um, what about what's next? I mean, is, is there any super secret stuff that we're not allowed to talk about or anything that maybe is a little more public in the planning stage that, uh, is coming out soon for blue dot. Can we talk about the vaccine yet, John? Oh, I thought you were going to talk about the blue dot theme park. So I wasn't sure if it was that or the vaccine. Uh, yeah, yeah, we've got a new vaccine. It's a little side business, side hustle that we got going on. The blue shot. The designer vaccine. Yeah. Um, I I don't think we have any big sort of rabbits to pull out of the hat. Well, I mean, there's a few few new things happening. One is, um, you know, we've never been um, a brand that that has had a lot of uh, accessories or knickknacks, and you know, we don't have flatware and dishes and vases. I mean, we have some of those things, but there are always just a few of them, just a couple carefully considered ones. So, um, we are adding a, a decent amount to to that lower end price spectrum part of our assortment. So again, not tons of it, but um, more things that can be giftable and sort of under $200. So um, furniture is an infrequent purchase, um, major furniture is an infrequent purchase. So mm-hmm. it gives people a reason to come back into the store and kind of see what's new and maybe pick something up. So that's that's been really fun. And the packaging and the branding and the the experience around that has been a really fun project too. It hasn't stopped with the product. Um, and now we're kind of figuring out the kind of merchandising and how that looks in stores. That's that's pretty awesome. Another one that we're proud of that it's been delayed because of the pandemic, but should kick off here pretty soon is a program called Open Studio, where um, we're going to open our stores uh, before hours on a weekend. I think it's every other month um, and offer um, design workshops to kids ages nine to 14 um, That's hopefully really cool. with an emphasis on, on communities where, um, where arts education has been cut and kids that don't get those kind of opportunities um, generally. And we developed a curriculum with the Walker Arts Center here in Minneapolis for really, you know, it's really multidisciplinary kind of not just product design or furniture design, but also interior design or fashion design or game design, graphic design. So um, hopefully opening up the, the world of design to, to younger kids and taking advantage of these beautiful physical spaces that we have in major cities around the country. Yeah. Uh, You mentioned, you mentioned also early on about this, you mentioned the stores that we have in the U S and we're continuing to open stores uh, in different markets. So that's, we're kind of on a two to three stores a year over looks like in the next couple of years. So that's a, it's, we already have stores, so we're already in that business, but it just is, you know, getting blue dot closer to people is really important. Um, any, any dream projects in the future, maybe either lines that you, uh, are thinking about for blue dot or, or maybe things outside of blue dot. We're, um, I'm working on a, we're working on a renovation of a, um, or somebody else is working on it for us. I should say of a, of a 1950s, um, bread delivery truck. That'll be a, a great little branded vintage, um, kind of food and beverage truck that we'll have here at our, at our headquarters for our uh, Thursday happy hour. So that's been a little pet side project that it's kind of, kind of a secret, but I guess not a secret anymore, but uh, it's a a secret to the staff. I kind of want it to be more of a surprise when it showed up. That's been fun. Yeah. I think my only, my retirement project is, is that I kind of think about a lot is uh, I'm sort of intrigued by the idea of, of designing and opening a boutique hotel. Mm. Or, you know, an independent hotel, but just the idea of kind of the whole experience. And maybe I travel too much. So I, I always have lots of ideas that are better than the ideas of the hotels that I'm staying in. So I have a, a backlog of ideas, but it seems like a fun thing to do. Yeah, I had a chance to tour. Um, I, I was friends with some of the folks that worked for the construction company that was working on the Shinola Hotel in Detroit. Uh, a couple of years back and I've only been like in the lobby at this point now since it's been finished, but I thought that was such a cool thing for a brand to, to do kind of that unexpected, like, you know, they make wristwatches and, and right. other pieces to do a whole, whole hotel. I think it's an awesome idea. Yeah. Or we got to, uh, there's a, in our store in New York on uh, Madison Avenue, there's, 
we have 5,000 square feet in the basement. And part of that basement is, could be a nice addition to our showroom, but part of it is kind of a little silence of the lambsy, uh, you know, a little, a little scary, uh, but Maurice, and I thought it'd be cool to build a, a little speakeasy down there that, that, you know, we only bring sort of special customers down or after the store is closed and it's kind of a secret. <laughs> So hopefully nobody from the New York City planning department is uh, watching. <laughs> I, I don't know if the audience includes a whole lot of those things. <laughs> uh, so what about like rough spots? I mean, we've all had, you know, some version of writer's block or design. You get stuck in the design process or just have a bad day or have bad interaction. Like how do you guys work through those kind of things or... Um, how do you kind of get yourself back in the right, right mindset? I think there's been so many of them that, <laughs> and we live, we've lived to play another day. So I think we've, we, we, maybe the earlier ones were the hardest ones. Uh, but now I sort of feel like I, I have, I've had a conversation just a couple of days ago with somebody that gave me some bad news and they were really nervous about telling me this and they were apologizing. And, and I just basically said, look, it's just it's Tuesday. And, you know, this is what happens this is what we do. So um, I think it's just, yeah, persistence. <laughs> yeah, and it's a realization funny that you said think... that about Tuesday. My last call, this, uh, the guy got on and said, my internet's not working today, you know, because it's Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think over the years, um, it's maybe the benefit of time and a little bit of wisdom that comes from it that you, you realize that, well, now after, I think, you know, and during the pandemic, like what, what, what bigger curveball or, or, you know, punch to the chin, can you, can you take as a, as a business that, you know, we never anticipated that. And, and um, I think we've come out stronger and you learn things and you, you always end up better than um, when you went in. I think, you know, one of the other things that we're, we're getting a little bit better at is, is I think sometimes when you're working on a design it it can it can either have a kind of mission creep where it kind of like veers off the rails a little bit and isn't really answering the the question of the brief that you put in front of yourselves to begin with, or it's just not quite there. Um, and we work as a collaborative, so you know we we have a, a larger design studio. Maurice and I act more like creative directors, and I think we sometimes are maybe too nice in the sense that we we let things go on when we maybe should just say you know what I don't know if there's anything worthwhile down that path. Let's just stop right here mm -hmm. and reset and, and start over again. And recently we, we launched a plastic chair, our first injection mold of plastic chair. And, and it really took somebody else on the team to, to, to stop us, to say like, you know, and I don't know how we ended up here, but I'm not sure this is really right. And I really think that we should reset. And um, that took a lot of courage for her to say. She wasn't one of the designers, but is in product development. And, um, and she was totally dead on right. And, uh, and all of us came together as a group and stopped and reset and the, and the ultimate um, result was a much, much better design than where we were. So, hmm. so maybe really the, cool. maybe the theme there is, is trust your gut. Yes. hundred <laughs> percent. Well, the other thing I think of John is, is the, the uh, metaphor you use a lot is a steady hand on the tiller is that you can't, you, you know, you can't move the rudder back and forth every day because something different happens. You know, you have to sort of, have a plan and trust it and, you know, make small adjustments as you move along. But especially as the team gets bigger, you just, you, you can't have people not understanding where, where you're going every day. Uh, so I think, I think that's an important part of getting to those rough patches is just sticking to the plan and stay, you know, sticking together and, and having some confidence in where you're going. You know, maybe that chair example was one of these, but I'm curious if there are things, um, especially as designers, I think we see other things that become trends in the market or we try to emulate or we see lots of other people doing things that just kind of start to drive us crazy after a while, like not in a good way. <laughs> are, what are the things that you guys see right now, either in retail or furniture design that just kind of bug you or are <laughs> things that you would intentionally avoid doing? I'm sort of particularly bugged by, and this is, I'm not sure if this is a term out there, but I've heard the term tech washing, but I'm going to say design washing. It's these brands that are kind of washed in design, but they're a little skin deep. You know, I think um, with, with Instagram or the internet, it's, it's pretty easy to launch a, a kind of one product 
brand of some kind. And they all seem to have the same graphic designer and the same kind of branding and the same kind of packaging. And, um, but the product is sort of okay. It's solid. It's not like remarkable, but it's all the wrapping uh, that is kind of um, pretty trendy and, and kind of seemingly coming from a similar, a similar place, right. but the integrity of the, of the brand underneath it isn't um, doesn't match up with the, with the exterior, if that makes sense. Yeah. So is that, is, is that John, what the, is there a, tr- a phrase that's like premium, premium mediocrity? Is that? Yeah, there's, it was, an, I think it was a New Yorker article. I, I, the, I think the writer wrote about this, but it was like, yeah, I think he called it premium mediocre. Um, so the product is actually mediocre. So if you just handed somebody the t-shirt, it's so what do you think you'd say? It's a t-shirt, but if you went through the whole experience of the Instagram yeah. feed and the brand and the website, and you would think that it was the, it was the most amazing thing that's ever been invented. Oh, I mean, you just have to go to a couple of our, some of our competitors, even smaller competitors, comment feeds on their Instagram page. And it's just a, you know, a, a bitch fest of um, upset customers. So it's sort of mm-hmm. like, you know, you have this you know, like great veneer of a brand and a product, but if you can't produce it well, produce it on time, ship it on time, answer the phone when customers have a question, if you can't do the basics of running a business, then it's sort of like, what's the point? You know, it seems a little bit like you're, you know, faking your way through. So I used to call that professionally bad that like <laughs> you took the time to make it. You were really trying to do, go through the process. It just, it, it just turns out really bad. Anyhow. <laughs> um. So you guys have both shared some good advice along the way through this conversation. I'm curious if you have maybe favorite pieces of advice that you have received or some favorite ones to pass along to new members of your team. Yeah. I, I, the one I always think about is um, I don't know if it was advice given to me or something I read long ago, but it basically said that a, you know, a cathedral is built one brick at a time and I think, especially when you're young in your career, you want, you just want the cathedral. You just want it today. And I think you realize over time that you have to enjoy laying the bricks because it's the best things that are built are things that are built over time. And, and you have to enjoy laying the bricks every day individually. Uh, so it's not about the cathedral. It's about the process of laying the bricks. I think that's, especially when you're young, I think, you know, I think John and I would both say we were pretty impatient when we were young and uh, I think it's important to think about the long haul and what you can accomplish over, over a longer period of time. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. I, I got some advice when I was leaving business school that was really uh, important to me. It came from an entrepreneur and I was, I was applying for a, a, a fellowship for entrepreneurship. And um, he asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, I want, I want to start my own business. And he said, what kind of business? And I, I, I pulled up some random business that I had written a business plan for, but it wasn't, it was actually a, a, in the bridal market, believe it or not. I was going to a ton of weddings at the time and I thought it was a great idea. And he looked at me and he's like, oh, are you interested in like bridal stuff? And I'm like, well, no, not really. <laughs> and he's like, well, what are, you, what are you interested in? Like, what do you love? I'm like, well, I love building stuff. I love designing things. I love building things um, like, like furniture and things like that. And, and he's like, well, do that. And, you know, I was like, what do you mean? He goes, well, look, you spent your life working hard, going to the right schools and getting the right jobs. You got a good resume. He's like, just pick something that you love and try and do it better than other people. Um, and he goes, you'll be successful. Mm-hmm. And, and it was a total light bulb for me. It's like when I think entrepreneurs out there thinking about starting a business, they're thinking they've got to come up with the next, you know, mousetrap or some, some new invention of some kind. But um, what could be simpler than starting a furniture company? So, um, you know, pretty low tech really. So that was great advice. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Well, that's um, like the, like going back to Patagonia, right? That's what Yvonne Schnard did. He was, he wanted, he needed better climbing equipment. He wanted to, there was some missing thing and he wanted to be, have better climbing equipment and look what he built. Mm-hmm. So as we're starting to, wind down here. I'm curious if you guys have any, um, especially as we mentioned Patagonia, any, any encouragements or, um, any, uh, challenges that you'd like to issue for our listeners? 
There's that great, uh, I think it's a poster and uh, we have it in our shop, uh, Anthony Burrell, a graphic designer. He just said, work hard and be nice to people. I think that's like the simplest advice I give to my, my kids and I would give to others, especially in this day and age. <laughs> Can't top that. <laughs> Well, hey, before we let you guys go, um, tell our listeners where they can learn maybe more about the two of you individually, as well as find all the good stuff about Blue Dot on the interwebs. <laughs> go ahead, Maurice. Give him the plug. How about BlueDot.com? Yeah. So no, we do have a, well, there is an about us section that has a few different sort of you know, forks in the road that you can take to learn about kind of our philosophy about design, what, how we started the company. I think there's a few videos on there that are kind of interesting about the history and the origin story. Yep. And, uh, or, or buy our book, uh, I think which you know, published by Rizzoli and, and I think available on Amazon, I'm not sure, but, um, yeah. Or at your local independent bookstore. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. We'll be sure to link to all of that good stuff in the show notes. And actually, I um, I did watch a couple of those videos before we chatted today. So, you know, kind of strangely feel like we had met before having this conversation. But it's been awesome uh, chatting with you guys and learning more about Blue Dot. Um, so thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, Josh, Josh, thanks for having us. Thanks. Enjoyed yeah. it. And thanks for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode 167 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. Thanks again to The Perfect Match for sponsoring today's episode. Visit theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more and bring your design skills to win big. That's theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed. Add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.